everybody, and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious. Uh, once again, to people who may have triggers or might be a little sensitive to this subject, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on personal stories about suicide. Uh, if you don't want, if you're not comfortable with the subject material, uh, but you're interested in learning or hearing about it, I would ask that you listen to this with a close friend that may help you through it. If you're very uncomfortable with the subject matter as a whole, I would ask that you refrain from listening to it at all, just for your own uh, mental protection. Tony, welcome again to uh, Knocked Conscious, sir. Hi, Mark. Hi. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming. And uh, did you bring the Kleenex? Because I'm going to need a couple of boxes. Yeah. So last week, suicide, we discussed suicide and, and how people feel and how we can approach them and how we should approach people and at least ask and talk to people and keep communication open with people feeling differently or mm -hmm. feeling like they, they might show those signs, right? Yeah. But yeah. today we wanted to share a little bit more about how these, if we don't do what we talked about last week, what happens and how that affects those around us and, and I think how that's, it directly affects other people. And that's as equally as important as well. I think by sharing our own personal stories, as you say, it helps, it helps people not only be more informed, but um, maybe it will give the people more motivation to help other people make, to make sure that this kind of thing, you know, doesn't happen again if they, if they encounter it themselves. And it might open their eyes to certain signs as well. Yeah. Uh, so, if you'd like, at your convenience, please, uh, if you'd like to start with your first personal story. Okay, so I'll share a story. I shared a story about my friend Mark uh, in the first uh, podcast in last week's. Uh, so uh, another friend of mine, Alex, uh, he was in his late 20s. Uh, this happened uh, 12, 13 years ago. Alex was a really funny guy. He was vibrant. Um, no one had a clue about what was going on going on for him uh, if you kind of think of the least possible person to have mental health issues it, it would have been Alex so none of us uh, had a clue but he was clearly going through a lot and he he ended his life by jumping off Beachy Head uh, Beachy Head is a well-known uh, suicide spot here in the UK and his his death just sent shockwaves through our little community of friends and and family and it was really hard to deal with why. Jess, Jess mentioned in, in her email about uh, of, often uh, the people that are left behind uh, are left struggling with why did someone do this? Uh, and over time, we started to piece a few things together and uh, there were certain clues as to, as to why he did what he did. Um, but it's the fact that he perhaps he didn't feel that he could talk to anyone. Um, and then that questions your own kind of level of friendship uh, with that person. It's just absolutely devastating. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, these things are really hard. And it's interesting because we do kind of internalize it a little bit. Like I, mm -hmm. I had a friend who had an illness and I only heard about it after he recovered and how selfish of me to say, why didn't you tell me about this? Yeah. <laughs> In a weird way, right? Like I don't, but it may have helped him, you know. Hmm. You know, and as friends, we 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 want to think that you know we're there for people and and that we can help them. But was there okay. something specific about it that that you saw now or in hindsight that you could show that you could maybe share with someone to look for now? Um, there were, yeah, there were there were periods of he was the life and soul he was really vibrant but but there was also periods of him being down but then everyone can be down uh, he, he certainly wasn't like down and, and depressed uh, but there were moments when he wasn't I guess on form but we were so used to him being you know on form and being yeah. the life and the soul uh, but but yeah like, like we mentioned before just looking out for those for those little signs um I, I do also remember that there was, he had a girlfriend, but I can remember that he would very often make uh, jokey comments about sexuality. And we later discovered that uh, 
possibly one of the reasons was struggling with his own sexuality. Uh, so perhaps if someone had picked up on the fact that he was making these jokey comments, that actually there was something a little bit more, more serious going on there. Um, yeah. But That's hindsight, it's hindsight, isn't it? It is hindsight. Um, I can speak a little bit to that life of the party thing. Um, Cause we mentioned Robin Williams, for example, mm. the pressure to keep that persona up is daunting. Mm. Um, I think that I kind of was the life of the party. Like I knew every song I would sing along. I'd be this jovial, but honestly, that's not who I was inside uh, until I sought help, you know? So was it like a performative thing? Well, if, well, if you're, if, if you're the life of the party, how could you possibly be sad? Hmm. Right? But, like, but being the life of the party, was it, was it like a oh, performance that you felt you had to put on? It, it, you know, I'm, I'm naturally that way, but I think over time you kind of build a persona, right? Hmm. So then it become it becomes a thing that you, cause it's like, I'm sure that growing up, like you were that guy that did that. Like my friend was that guy. You know, he was the tall guy or he was the fast guy or he was the athletic guy. Right. We had I was the jokester, for example. So I I would think like internally, the pressure to always be on was very tiresome. Hmm. So I would I would seclude myself a lot because I didn't I felt in the presence of like I bathe in energy of other people, I think. okay. so that lifts me up, but it also totally drains me because I give it all away. Hmm. So then I isolate, but that creates other problems, right? So it's kind of like that. But Mm -hmm. yeah, would you ever guess that someone like a Robin Williams would ever be depressed even? Would it be sad, ever have a sad moment? Yeah, you wouldn't. But, you know, as I said, everyone's allowed to feel down. Everyone's allowed to get depressed. And and in a weird way, the side of the manic, which is the party goer, is the depressed, right? Yeah. There is the that, that dichotomy to that. There is a crashing uh, when you're that life all the time. It's usually in, not in plain sight, right? It's usually hidden. It's usually yeah. buried. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Did you want to share a little bit more about Mark's story at all before I talk about mine and then you close with yours? Uh, no, uh, but I'll, I'll just uh, share uh, the last kind of like friend story. Uh, a guy called Chris. Um, he was in his 30s. Oh, uh, Chris was a really lovely guy. Um, he was funny. Um, he was, but he was very tortured. Um, I, I knew Chris originally in a professional capacity. So I, I was a, a, a tele sales manager many moons ago and, uh, Chris was one of my employees. Uh, but there was something about Chris that kind of got under my skin and in a good way. And, uh, we became, uh, good friends for a period of time. Um, outside of work and it became quite clear that Chris uh, Chris's childhood kind of mirrored mine in a way so I guess I took on a bit of a men- mental role with him uh, just helping him through some of the the feelings he was having about having that traumatic uh, childhood uh, and then like you said in the in the last podcast uh, you know over time uh, people separate people um, you know, life happens and he went in his direction and, and I went in mine. And I can remember it's really vivid, a really vivid memory of bumping into him in a local supermarket. And I looked at him and he, he was with his girlfriend. He looked at me and we didn't even acknowledge each other. And I remember this, this, this thought just came in my head. I need to speak to Chris. I need to say hello to him. But I didn't. I turned away. So a few years after that, I was around a friend's house and... Um, I got a, uh, she also knew Chris and um, we got a, uh, a message uh, or I got a message through uh, from someone on Facebook to say, uh, did you know that Chris killed himself? He hung himself. Um, and it turned out that uh, he, he was tortured. He did have a lot of problems. He was experiencing uh, professional support and uh, his friends at the time were being really supportive to him. Um but for one one reason or another, they just couldn't get through. Perhaps they didn't have the, the toolkit, um, or perhaps he just wouldn't wouldn't let them through. Uh, but yeah, I think 
I think out of out of those three men that I knew, I think Chris's death, although I hadn't spoken to him for, for quite a period of time, affected me more um, more than anyone else's, which is a bit of a strange thing to say. But it's, I, and I think it's because we all knew Chris's potential, and um, it's just such a it's such a loss. It really is a tragedy. You know, when we speak about tragedy, yeah, there's personal tragedies, but it's just tragic uh, when when someone with so much to give does some, does something like that. On the plus side, though, um, I I did reconnect with uh, his best friend, and um, and we still still talk to this day. Uh, and Sam's probably listening to this, so hello, Sam. Um, but hello, yeah, Sam. so that was Chris. So you had Chris, Alex, and Mark. Yeah, the three. Yeah. Did, I'm sorry. That's that one. It sounds like you built a deep friendship out of a an initial dislike in a weird way. Did you, did you have some kind of it kind of built out of respect almost? No, I think it built. Um, it built out it sound like this, he challenged you or something or not challenge you but well it was out of this this commonality of of, of the childhood um, okay yeah i think that's yeah. that's really how it how it grew that's beautiful um i'm sorry i'm sorry to everyone's families as well um how did are you still in touch with the friend of the friend of, um, of, of chris yeah i'm still in touch with sam yeah uh sam and the woman that you got the message <clears throat> well? uh yes still in touch oh, with her excellent yeah. Good. Um, and do you have do you have one more, or is the are those the three? Uh, they're the three. It, yeah, I'll, I'll, and then you want to end with yours? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That's all excellent. Right. Okay. Is that okay? Does that work for you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, is there anything you like? Any personal messages you want to send to the families of Alex, Chris, or Mark before we continue? Just that I hope that they're coping with with their grief and. Uh, that they've had professional support themselves and that uh, there are people like Jess said in her email, you know, there are people that are there for them that are thinking of them and that are sending them love and, and all the wishes in the world. Yeah. And the guilt, right? The guilt, the personal guilt, the survivor guilt is so daunting at times. Yeah. Please don't let that there sometimes you'll never know or you can piece some pieces together but it's it's a challenge it's one of those mysteries that always seems to haunt us but we have to be able to let that portion of that go we can still hold on to the greatness but let the part of the guilt go for sure and it's really important to not think that you are responsible you know if you have tried to help someone and that hasn't helped it's they haven't done what they're doing because you didn't help enough uh there are so many different things. There would be so many different things going on in that person's head. But hopefully through, as we said, through talking and pointing people in the right direction, it, it should never have to get to that stage. Yeah. I look at the clock and it's 1234. Synchronous right there. Wow. <sighs> uh, do you have any final thoughts about everyone, about about your stories, Tony? Just that, just that I miss them. But let's, you're, let's hear from you, Mark. Everyone who leaves this world is missed by somebody. Yeah. So I think that's a beautiful thing to talk about. All right. Um, are you, I don't know if I'm ready, but are you ready? <laughs> are you ready, Mark? Yeah, I, I hope so. So my story evolves around my entire it literally starts with my desire to be dead. Um, uh, let's see here. <laughs> how long ago was so this? I, uh, what's that? How how long ago was this desire? Yes, it's uh, it's about March 2015. Okay, and I am 40, going on 41. Uh, cause I'm going to turn 41 in September. So, you know, we want to talk mid midlife crisis, right? Yeah. Literal midlife crisis. So, uh, I walk into this gentleman's office. He says I'm different and I lose it. And he, it's almost an instantaneous snap for me. Um, but I didn't understand why I'm different, right? Like you and I have, I haven't shared that much, but I shared my first interview recently with people and about my psychic ability or, 
I don't know if it's ability or whatever it is. It's, it's real. My experiences yeah. are real. I don't know how much they're tied to me, but they happened. You know, um, I walk in this gentleman's office and he's an NLP person and NLP people do like hypnosis to a point. My first hypnosis under this gentleman, uh, there was a shooting in South Carolina where nine people were shot, including the pastor. And I saw the vision of that the week before it happened. Wow. It was the first, it was the first thing I, I never experienced anything like this. I came out of this meditation. He told me to look, he told me that I was on the beach and I, I looked up in the sky and there were these rotating sheets of glass and it was like looking at televisions through a store window, you know, like in Christmas time, you look through the store window yeah. to like the TVs. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of that. And during the, during the turning of it, I saw a black man at a podium with a suit turn to his right, turn to his left. And I saw a gunshot go off and I directly tied it to a video that I shared last week uh, or two weeks ago with that interview. So it's all together there. I wasn't the one who saw that it's the actual NLP person that said, that's what, that's what you saw. And it, it shook me. It shook my foundation because I've had like little psychic experiences in the past, uh, little things, but nothing to this extent. So once I had that epiphany, I started seeking a lot of spiritual things in Arizona of which there are a lot, by the way, cause we have Sedona and all these other cool energy places. <laughs> Uh, so I started seeking these, uh, star seeds and empath and all these spiritual kind of people. Okay. Hmm. They have this group called meetup. I don't know if they have meetup in, in the UK, yeah. but it's basically like, it's like an app that y'all find a common group to join. Right. Yeah. So I go to this one thing and I have my first, I go to the first time ever and we all share our story. The next week it came up again and some, you know, it was like, should I go again or whatever? I'm like, you know what? Something's telling me to go. I should just go. I started following my intuition a little bit and I'm sitting at the plate at the house and my back is towards the door and it's like a long hallway and a door, the door opens and I immediately feel this weird like thing come over me. Right. I just knew something was up. Right. I turn around, it's a young man, 24 year old man and his mother uh, looked like it could have been an older girlfriend. Who knows? Right. I wasn't certain what the relationship was, but it, it, I was like, okay, cool. We all sit down and the woman sits at a sofa. The gentleman sits at the end of the sofa. And then there's another sofa, like, you know, L shaped, like catty corner. So I sat next to the gentleman on the other sofa, if that makes sense. Mm. So he was like right next to me, but like on a corner. So we all share our story and I, I, I'm like, you know, everybody, please go ahead, whatever. So everybody started and we get to the gentleman's mother and the mother starts sharing her story about her son and how he always had, he's always feisty and want to get into fights and angry and hurt. And there's, this is the last, the last hope I have for him. I, this is the last place I could take him to find anything to help him. I'm, I don't understand and I'm lost. And that was heartbreaking. But then, then Jay told his story. Uh, he's 24. He had a really bad motorcycle accident. Once again, I, it's my opinion that traumas have caused a lot of spiritual awakenings because they affect the brain physically and do something. Mm -hmm. I think they, they physically change you. I don't, I just don't know. Um, he was in a coma and he was young, 18, 19 years old. He's a motocross guy. And he, and when he came out of it, he was a little different. Um, so Jay shares his story and he just looks around the room <sighs> and he, I don't know why, but I, ha I'm like this. Okay. So this kid is like six. I'm five, eight. I'm a chunky little bastard. Okay. This dude's like six, two and like ripped. He's a personal trainer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't want to mess with this guy. And his mom's just told us that he's gotten into fights and been to jail, right? Like, or like over fights, right? Over, you know, altercations. Mm -hmm. But something told me to put my hand on him. So I put my hand on his knee. And he just, he just stared at me and lost it. It's like, there was nobody else in the world. 
And uh, I just, I knew I had to just touch. You know what I mean? It was just like the littlest gesture. Yeah. And uh, he wrote me an email the next day. Um, I'd like to share it. Dated uh, May 19th of 2016 is when this happened. Because it's about a year into my kind of awakening, right? Yeah. Hey, man, I just want to say thanks for being yourself yesterday. Was in a bad place mentally, uh, in parentheses, wrote frozen. Your super amazing energy and acceptance to really care what I was saying and understanding got me to break out of my shell. My ADD was out of control after that, so couldn't even listen to others at all, even though I tried. Would love to talk and get another understanding and perspective if you ever have any free time. Extremely important time in my life to me yesterday, and I know there is only more to finally understand myself. I don't believe in coincidences, and I and not the coincidence that there was only one person with that special energy, a very familiar, comforting energy. I could be open with to no issue, uh, open to with no issues. That is not me either. LOL. Just wanted you to know I appreciate beyond words. Nobody in my life has ever heard the real me. Take care. Wow. So just so, from that simple little gesture. Yeah. That's all it took. Yeah. Complete stranger. Complete stranger. Um, I immediately wrote him back. I said, when do you have free time? And I think it was a meeting on a Wednesday. And I think we agreed to meet on Saturday for coffee. On Friday, he tell, sends me an email. He broke up with his girlfriend. So I knew that he was letting go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Every sign was there. And we met at a park. Uh, we, we ended up, we started outside of a coffee shop because, hey, let's go to this park. And he was, I'm like, okay, cool. It's uh, May, you know, it's May, what, 20th or something. And it's so freaking hot in Arizona that we were under a tree and I got sunburned. We were there for four hours. It was 105 degrees and we just stood there. And I, I literally stood there with him for four hours and just let him just be right. Just yeah. be with him. Uh, and I like, I know that saved his life. I didn't save his life, but I know that did. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so he would, you know, he'd go through his manic and depressive points and there's a spiritual connection and I'll share that. Uh, we used to go to meditations together. Uh, we have a psychic medium that we're friends with and my best, my friend that I actually moved out here with, uh, her name's Heather. She actually, he moved in with her. They were roommates for a bit. Uh, so we all had the, some kind of weird, just weird spiritual connection. Um, so he had an idol. He idolized a guy named Greg Plitt, who was a personal trainer. And he was one of those motivational speakers. If you're familiar with like a Dave Goggins kind of guy, like, hey, get the fuck up, man. Right, right. Right. You know, like one of those. Yeah. And he was a personal trainer. So it kind of fit his, his warrior mentality, you know? Mm. Well, this gentleman died in a tragic train accident. I think it was at the L.A. like exchange he was he was filming and he wasn't authorized to be there and he literally got hit by a train and was struck and killed by a train yeah. and for a long time jay would say man that guy I'm, I'm you know like almost like i'm going like he's going like no joke and i'm like you know he idolized this guy who died it wasn't he didn't do it on it's not like he did it as a heroic gesture he he did it incorrect. You know what I mean? Like he did it illegally he was filming illegally and he died, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's two. Th so that was May of 2016. So let's go forward a full year. It's August of 2017. And, uh, I am quote unquote funny enough. I am at a Phoenix, a Phoenix Metro, like a Metro, like a commerce group. And I'm talking with a man whose 27 year old son took his own life. And I get a phone call from Heather. And Jay's gone. 
disappeared. He was gone for two days, and they found his truck up in New Mexico. And he threw himself in front of a freight train. He's 25. And uh, guilt. He sent me a text while he was up there, and I didn't know where he was. And he just said, where are you, man? And I didn't reply. And then he sent me a picture of a sunrise. And that was it. So. Jesus. But if, if, if I hadn't met him a year earlier, he wouldn't, we, we had another year with him, you know, I mean, honestly. So the, the, the gift that I had with him for a year and change, I'm so happy I'm blessed for. But losing him was hard. And are you still living with any guilt? Uh, no, not. I mean, I, I know of it, right? I'm aware of it. But, like, it's hard to feel like the savior and the executor. Why would you feel like the executor? My lack of response, because I know okay. he needed, he needs immediate response. Mm. And uh, to your point, like your friend, uh, to say they had too much shit going on in my head, I wasn't going to say that, but I was like, I can't, I can't handle them right now. So that's where we're at. Um, and and also, Mark, with life, we can't, we can't always be all things to all people. We can't be there immediately for someone. Life, life happens, unfortunately. Thank you. I, I have made peace with it. I wow. have. Thank you for that. And for people who do feel guilt, I want to let you know that if you do, it does get better. Hmm. But you have to you have to really address it and work through it. Yeah, for sure. And talk with people who knew those people because they will tell you it's not your fault. They'll help you as well. You need mental help, too. Or you need help through this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sir. So the 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 photo uh, of the. the, the Jay shared with you I, I guess that would have been one of the last things that he would have seen so in a, in a sense you're you're really honored to receive that the fact that he shared that with you I, I am honored that he sent his final share with his final time with me yeah 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 um so this is where it gets weird how about that that's not the weird part um a week later we had a little, like a group, we used to meet at a park in Arizona. And we had a little get together with everyone who knew it through me, through Heather, through our, like our, you know, not our meditation group, our, our spiritual people. Right. Mm. And our friend, her name's Crystal Vermeer and she's a, she's a psychic medium. And she, we were like, do we think we'll get messages? Like we were kind of messing around. Right. Like, there's no way. And Jay sent messages to us, each of us individually. And wow. I, I'd, if if you're okay with that, I'd like to share a couple of them. Yeah. Jay and I had some very deep conversations. He had unique conversations with everyone. I'll share the one with Heather first because uh, basically what happened was Crystal would get a message and she'd pull people aside. Like she literally would pull individuals aside and say, this is for you. So uh, for for Heather, what Jay said was uh, he was pulling like, like, you know how Superman ripped his clothes off like Clark Kent, like yeah. in a phone booth to open. Yeah. And she kept saying wetsuit, wetsuit or something like pulling his chest apart. And Heather immediately started. She lost it. Lost, like we're all watching and she literally lost her composure. Jay used to tell her that the body's just a skin. It's just a wetsuit. You can rip it right off. And wow. it was the weirdest thing, right? So, like, you want to talk about a message. And then yeah. I got mine. And I am I am a debunker, my friend. I have a hard time buying this stuff. But there were two messages from me. And it's funny because uh, he used to have conversations with me. Only me about this stuff. Cause, and Crystal knew of him but never really spoke with him, if that makes sense. So it's not like she had any information about this. Hmm. 
So she goes, Mark, I have a message for you. And I said, you can share it with everybody. It's not a big deal, right? She goes, <laughs> he's, he's throwing a Rubik's cube at you. He's throwing a Rubik's cube at you. And like, literally like waterworks, right? Yeah. His conversations with me, he used to say, I figured out the world. It's a Rubik's cube. I figured it out. I figured it out. He used to have sketches. He used to draw things. And he actually drew like a picture of a Rubik's cube because I figured it out. I figured out the world. It's everyone thinks it's this crazy math stuff, but it's so simple. Like obviously, you know, Jordan was mm -hmm. troubled, but he, but he, he was onto something, right? But that she picked that up was unbelievable to me. That's incredible. There is no one. There is no one who knew that conversation. Um, and then one more that she said was funny because at the end of every time we saw each other, he'd want to like shake my hand or something. And I go, brothers don't shake hands. Brothers <laughs> got a hug. And I do the Tommy boy thing, right? With Chris Farley. Yeah. And she, she said to me, he's doing some Saturday Night Live thing with his hands open. Like, and I'm like, that's, uh, I mean, I don't I don't think it's a stretch, obviously that those two, you know, that's where that came from basically. Yeah. Obviously it was a movie that they were in, but it, they were both cast on Saturday Night Live. So it, he, he's reached out and he's reached out at other times. I think in my life, if I'm attentive or not, you know, hummingbird here or something, but um, yeah, that's, that's Jay. Well, I'm really sorry for your loss, Mark. Thank you. The world, the world should be sorry. Yeah. The world's, that's, the world's losing some lost someone. Yeah. That's a really beautiful thing to say, Mark. In, in, in terms of, uh, of Jay reaching out, how, how did that kind of inform your, your grieving process? You mean the text that he sent me right before? No, uh, so so, re so reaching out um, afterwards dur during the group with the messages. Yes. So how when the second I touched him, I knew we were connected. I wasn't going to let him go, if that makes any sense. Mm. So I had already emailed him while he was sending me an email. And I had already sent his mother an email because I was wondering how she could help, right? Cause I didn't know cause the challenges that she was having. Mm. So I kind of multi-pronged And then as soon as he responded and said, he broke up with, I got his phone number. We were talking or texting right away. And when he said he left his girlfriend on, he, he broke up with his girlfriend on Friday. said, I need to see you tomorrow. I think, I think that's how it kind of worked out. Okay. And, um, yeah, he, he did ask, I mean, it, I'm, I'm grateful that he asked for help. Cause if he pushed me away, there would have been nothing, nothing would have happened. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> but honestly, like I said, a complete stranger, all I had to do was look at him and just acknowledge that he's hurting. Yeah. And like you say, it's those, it's those little moments that, yeah. that, that can have such a massive impact. Yeah. And, and yeah, the fact and that you, that you got the messages through from the psychic as well shows just how deeply connected you were. Um, and I think that's all of us too, right? Cause like yeah. how, how else I wouldn't have been connected to him unless I met him a year before mm. I had, you know what I mean? Like there, obviously there's this weird, I don't want to put a consciousness or like a reasoning behind everything or purpose, but I think we should still live purposeful lives. Right. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, it, it hurt to feel like I was the person who saved him and also let him drown. But you didn't let him drown, Mark. No, no, not at all. But that's the feeling, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's where that's what we have to work through. So with with the signs, that I mean, it sounds like you're still you're still experiencing signs from Jay, maybe to this day. How I I've personally closed them off a little bit, I think, because I I'm probably more a little fearful of it. Okay. Um, but I would maybe I can bring Heather on and she can speak. She she was got very close. Very interesting. He drew pictures. Uh, I told you he kind of had a sketchbook. Yeah. And uh, the second I drew, uh, I had a bunch of pictures I took. I showed them to Heather, for example. She goes, I got to meet him. She had never met him before. And it was a while Crystal, Heather, and I were just sitting there doing some other event. 
And uh, yeah, Heather's like, I got to meet him. And that created their friendship, you know? So. Wow. It's strong, strange world sometimes, but hmm. I, it's, I mean, look, if we all came, I feel like we all came from one, one place, so we're all connected. I mean, it doesn't, this whole from one thing and oneness, that's not an, it's not a distruth or an untruth, hmm. you know? So anyway, that is Jay, my friend. Well, I feel and privileged Jay, to, I miss to, you. yeah, I feel privileged to have known Jay just through what you, through what you've said. Thank you. He, he's the most beautiful person i'm gonna share the picture too I, I still have the phone you know how you switch out phone plans yeah i kept i kept the phone because i wanted to keep the yeah. the string of text yeah um it's just that important to me you yeah. know and and as it should be as well thank you um but it, that, so your story reminds me of uh, something kind of similar that happened with me so uh, with mark um so years after mark passed away I went to see a spiritualist medium and uh, my granddad had just passed away and I was hoping to contact uh, to contact him. But instead, Mark came through. Uh, and so pretty much like like, like, like what you said, uh, this spiritualist medium didn't have any idea who Mark was or any of our kind of like stories. And her first vision that came through was um, I, she said, I can see an oak tree, but it's painted blue. And I immediately knew that was Mark because one of the places we used to hang around with, uh, hang around at as kids was this uh, kind of forest wooded area. And one of the trees was painted blue. So that got out of here. Yeah, that really blew my mind at the time. So I knew it was Mark coming through. But his message was um, because I I didn't go to Mark's uh, funeral. Um, I just had my second. uh, Physically, I didn't. But (laughs) I just had my second daughter at that point. And um, I can remember on the day of the funeral thinking a lot about Mark uh, and feeling guilt that I wasn't there. And his message was, I know why you didn't come to the funeral, um, because you were looking after your daughters. And and I found that really helpful. Um, it certainly helped me uh, deal with my grief with Mark. Um, but yeah, isn't it interesting? Uh, the whole medium spiritualist thing. Yeah. Sir, I have the story of stories that I'll probably share with you online or offline. I may have the courage one day to put it as a podcast, but I, it, it still involves some personal people. So it's really challenging to do that. Okay. But uh, Crystal, the person, I, excuse me, the person I mentioned, mm. she literally described a story of my going home. Not, not just what happened, but literally the order in which it happened. Wow. And I've got the recording of the the medium, uh, and I've got the documented story of where I came across each of the things she said. Wow! And it's un—I'm I'm not kidding. It's unbelievable. It really is. Would you be able to share? Uh, has Crystal got a web address, or I uh, so uh, she she's I've lo- I've lost a little touch with her she moved to Tennessee and then moved back to Arizona but it's crystal k-r-y-s-t-a-l last name is Vermeer v is in Victor e-r m is in Mary e-e-r crystal okay. Vermeer um she'd be on Facebook uh you can tell her that she, you know me okay uh she's I think she's had some challenges spiritually because I think she's had some physical challenges lately I just haven't spoken with her directly so I don't want to speak for her or anything but she would love to reach out. I'm sure she'd love to hear from people. So um, it's pretty impressive. Do you, have you gone back to that spiritual person since? No, no, I haven't. Um, no, but uh, weirdly a, a couple of, it was last, I think last November, um, I was speaking to a spiritualist on Facebook and uh, she had a message for me from my granddad and from Chris. Um, yeah. Which again is just, it's weird, but it's also absolutely fascinating. And again, she had no idea of those two people. And, you know, when, when they talk about things that only you and that person knows, it's just, it's incredible, isn't it? It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And it opens I'll up share, all can, kinds I'll of share questions. one part. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. What was that? I was just going to say, it just opens up all these different kind of like questions and possibilities and, and connection as well. That even after death, we are still connected. Agreed 100%. Mm. But uh, so if I may, one of the parts of the reading, she said, you're going home to a place with an M. 
and and I was it was a surprise visit. So I wasn't staying at my parents and I wasn't staying anyone that I knew. I hadn't even known where I was staying yet, right? You're going someplace with an M and I'm thinking the city, the town, the state, it's nothing, nothing. I go and I end up staying at my mom's best friend's house. And as I'm leaving from the trip, I actually am leaving to go home. I turn around to close the door in the front door and it's their last name monogrammed on the mat of the door of their house. Wow. And I, and it's funny because Crystal and I had actually built a good friendship because I actually vetted her. I came back to her with her reading and asked her what she meant and told her what happened to, to give her like a little understanding. Hmm. And uh, I go, what do you mean? When you said house with them, she goes, I just see a house and I see a letter M on it. And I took a picture of everything. And I'm like, does this look like? She's like, yeah, that's what it, you know. Wow. And it was the last person's last name. I didn't even know I was staying there. So to your point, like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I yeah. couldn't have done that. Yeah. And that's just a small, small step. Yeah. Wow. Connection. So, so yeah. where are we at, my friend? <laughs> Do you want to share your story or where would you like to go from there, sir? Uh, yeah, I'll share mine. But before I do, just just checking in with you, Mark, and making sure that that you're okay after sharing your story. Thank you. I, I am good. Um, this brought up a lot because I hadn't thought about it for a while. So it was pretty rough all week because mm. we knew we were going to talk about it. But uh, thank you. How are you doing with, with I mean, you sounds like you've, it's touched you so many, so many different ways and with just so many different people. Yeah. But I, I guess because of the work that I do, um, you know, I'm able to, I guess, deal with it in a, in a bit of a different way than someone who doesn't work in mental health every single day. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm doing all right. But uh, just make sure that after this conversation, Mark, you, you can kind of like debrief or just do whatever you need to do to, to chill and you know what I'm saying. I, I do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, if I may, I plan t- uh, to watch WrestleMania. After. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I have, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm probably going to get pretty impaired and just, <laughs> okay. just watch WrestleMania. Uh, but uh, how, may I ask you a question about in your professional, how do you cope with these when you when you encounter these what's your best coping um being i guess being boundaried in a professional in a professional way but also you know we have supervisions um i work with a really tight team i'm really blessed to work with a team of people that i work with and uh you know we do it sounds corny we're kind of like a family but we do help each other out and uh, so it's not just about supervisions or set times to to debrief and talk about things we just yeah we just a good bunch of people and it's 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 important to talk isn't it and 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 share and help each other yeah. but i'm all, I, i'm also sorry i'm also really aware that i do feel really lucky to be working in the job that i'm working in because i can deal with all this kind of thing yeah um oh gosh i just lost my train of thought is uh you talk about the family stuff it's like how how can how can you put a clock on a social issue like, let's not kid ourselves, right? This the social problems happen 24 mm. seven, right? You might get a flat tire when you're driving. Sure. That's an, in, that's an event, but you can have any challenge mentally, emotionally at any time of the day. Like to, you know, when you talk about that supervision thing and the, like the checks and balances, like, yeah. how do you put a time? Like, Oh, you put your 40 hours in, I guess you can go home now. It's like, it doesn't seem like a job that affords you that. Uh but because the team is so tight and we do talk to each other, um, it does kind of like afford us that. You know, you I, I guess That's you have beautiful. to yeah you have to make your you have to make your own way, don't you? You have to make your own kind of uh, changes within the environment. Yeah, and that speaks to the strength of each of yourself and your individuals that are part of this team that you're that you curated right yeah it does but it, but also we work for a mental health charity, so uh, we do get a lot of support from. Uh, from the from the charity themselves are you allowed to plug them or do you uh, i'm allowed to but i'm choosing okay. not to <laughs> oh, absolutely completely understandable uh look it's all about all about courtesy here so <laughs> um well thank thanks for checking in and and thank you for letting me share that story i don't i don't just 
broadly advertise that story. That's not one that I care to want to go into every day, you know? Mm. No, thanks, Mark. Okay, so uh, share my story then, yeah? Uh, I, 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 ple- I would be honored, honestly, if you okay. would share that. So I've had uh, three uh, suicide attempts uh, in the past. The first was when I was a child, um, around the age of 10, uh, 11 years old. Um, I, I spoke about it in the previous podcast. I had a, a traumatic childhood. And at that time, I remember feeling uh, that this was just going to be my life. And I, I didn't want my life to always be, be like that. Um, and I can remember being up all night. I, I couldn't sleep. Um, obviously, as a child, my emotions aren't fully formed. Uh, but there was a lot of worry and anxiety. And I hadn't thought about suicide. I don't think I even knew the word suicide. Uh, but this thought popped in my head that I needed to uh, kind of like do something and go to sleep forever. And I can remember thinking about taking tablets. Now, where that idea came from, I've got no idea. I could have been influenced through media. I certainly can't remember the family uh, or my parents ever talking about uh, suicide. But for whatever reason, that that thought was in my head. So when everyone else was asleep, I went downstairs and I found... Uh, my mum's hay fever tablets. Now, I guess if I wanted to do a, a better job, I probably would have picked something a little bit stronger. So it's like over Benadryl, basically. <laughs> or I, I think some, they. I mean, they may have even been like, allergy medication, right? Yeah, yeah, allergy, oh allergy medication. But and, could, and you're ten. Yeah, I'm ten. Yeah. Oh, um, so I took that them. You got that you that you got that far though, really? <laughs> like, even is yeah. that you went to your mom's. Like when everybody's, how did you, do you remember like kind of how you were going to do that? Or did you, do you remember the planning of that or the thought of that? There wasn't a plan that it, it was just this thought that came in my head and I just did it like pretty much there and then. Wow. Um, and I, and I think for me, uh, what, what's frightening about that and, and, and just going back to the previous podcast about this increase in child suicide is that. During my attempts when I was an adult, there's a, a massive degree of self-preservation that comes into uh, suicide attempts. But as a child, because we're not fully formed emotionally, physically, uh, I'm guessing that that's why that self-preservation wasn't kicking in for me. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit later about uh, hope being mixed in with self-preservation. So I was completely in this mind that this is what I needed to do. And I just did, didn't want to wake up. So I took the tablets and um, went to sleep. And when I was asleep, I dreamt about my great nan who had passed away uh, was quite recently before that. And in the dream, it's very vivid, I remember it uh, now. She hugged me and she told me that everything was going to be okay. Uh, Sometime later, I woke up vomiting and I'd uh, vomited the tablets up. I'd never told anyone about it. Um, I felt pretty drowsy for the rest of the day. Um, But I remember feeling afterwards, it's it's weird. I remember feeling that there was this sense of hope in the idea that I could have killed myself. Because that was one way that I could have control over a life that I didn't have any control over whatsoever. So in a sense, it kind of empowered me. Um, And maybe this is childish thinking, um, but it empowered me to know that, you know, when everything else is out of control, I can control this to a certain degree. But I also think that's a very dangerous way uh, for a child to think. So if I may, you, you were saying like, I always have suicide in the back pocket, in my back pocket. If, if all yeah. else fails, yeah, I can, at least I know I can do this. I can control that. Yeah. And I think that sent, that set a bit of a precedent throughout the, the rest of my life, unfortunately. For whatever you, you went through in your childhood, I am, compl- I'm so sorry, whatever it is. Thanks Mark. So, um, and then the second time uh, in my late 20s. Um, so at this point, I've gone, I've gone through intensive counselling uh, and different forms of therapy for, for years. Uh, and, uh, and I was on medication and I was hoping they were going to work and, and they didn't. Um, I got to a point where I was just really, really depressed. 
in my 20s, my friends were getting married. Uh, my friends were in, you know, they were buying houses. I was living in a, a rented uh, flat uh, with with my cat. Um, and, and and it's that sense of comparing. I was definitely comparing my life to other people. And as a gay man, uh, there a, loads, a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, there's a stereotypical kind of like gay life and I didn't kind of like follow that. So there was a lot of... Uh, internal pressure uh, around that um and I can was, remember it was, there, was there is there some kind of structure that people assume uh in about a gay life or i i'm, um, I'm trying to come from a side of ignorance here uh because i don't understand your culture specifically is there was there something in that time frame as well in addition to your the comparison um I think it was more specifically around uh, kind of like looking at uh, other gay men and uh, not 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 seeing myself in them, uh, not particularly wanting to go to gay bars and gay clubs. Uh, I've always had a bit of a problem with um, kind of like sectoring off, you know, members of the community. I understand the need for you know gay culture and gay clubs, but it just, just didn't it just didn't fit in with me. Uh, and my gay friends seem to all be in relationships and uh, and I wasn't. Um, so I always, being gay was, I, I guess, you know, I had gay friends, they were my tribe, but I always felt a bit of an outsider. I didn't feel like, I didn't feel that I always uh, fit into that. Part of that could be what happens during childhood because uh, some of the abuse in childhood was sexual. And as a gay man, that is hard to deal with. Uh, yeah. The fact that, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. So yeah, go, getting back to the story. So it was around Christmas time. Um, uh, of course, my friends are all celebrating together for Christmas, and um, you know, I'm on my own. I can kind of smile about it now, but um, and I remember my mum. She would she'd always invite me around for Christmas uh, or, or Boxing Day, and I I, I refused. I just wasn't going to go, and it was kind of like in the middle of my isolating myself, um, just cutting myself off from everyone. And it got to the point where uh, my, I can remember once my stepdad uh, would come round just to check on me because no one had heard from me. I had friends coming round and checking on me. Uh, I didn't really want to see anyone. I wouldn't even have the electric on uh, in the flat. I just wanted to be in complete darkness. I was spending a lot of my time in bed. I also wasn't working at this point. So I guess this kind of added into the depression and exacerbated a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think through work. So, so you were literally completely, you didn't pick up a, you didn't even reach out to pick up a phone or even answer a phone. Is that, is that the level at which. Yeah, it it got to that. Uh, Phone calls were go unanswered. I'd unplug the phone. Um, I, I, I think when my stepdad came around to visit, it was because um, I'd unplugged the phone. And so yeah, mum couldn't get through to me. Uh, and it, it, it's not just about, for me, it wasn't just about cutting myself off from other people. It was about protecting other people from myself. Because I knew if I was going to start having this conversation with other people, especially with loved ones, they would be burdened with, you know, with everything that I'm talking about. And so there is that degree as well. Um, you know, we talk about being a burden to other people, but there's also that protectiveness for other people. It's not just a, it's not just a selfish burden. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, and it, and it's not misplaced, but it's misunderstood, right? That's, it's a confusion. Yeah. Because we, have. we don't, we think it's this, but it really isn't. It's a feel. It's a feel because we're being directed by misinformed emotions. Yeah. And, and I, it would be my guess. I mean, you, you yourself, myself, I'd say we're probably pretty sensitive gentlemen. Yeah. Um, we probably would even internalize that even more. You know what yeah. I mean? Those feelings of protection and, and not burdening. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course that, that gives rise to feelings of guilt and added pressure and. Yeah. And it, yeah. it snowballs for sure. What a web we weave. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it got to the point where I, um, I cut my wrists. Um, thankfully it didn't work. Uh, but after that, that kind of served as the point that I had to get better and I did engage more with professionals. I forced myself out of, out of my isolation and yeah, life was really good for, for a while. Uh, and I think although I'd had years of counseling and therapy beforehand, 
it's really important to find good a good counselor or or a good therapist you can have years of years of it but it's not going to do anything if you don't have that connection with uh, your counselor so after yeah. after that attempt i met this amazing woman called christine and um yeah she was she helped me through a lot um yeah and, and as much if i may as much as it is just a good quality counselor because good quality professionals can probably deal with every personality um there is that one that suits your personality like yeah. if i went to someone different than the guy i went to and and i'm happy to his name is jeff danes uh he's a brit actually uh, g-e-o-f-f last name danes d is in david a-n is in nancy e-s okay. he works with inspires nlp they're out of arizona and uh i you know like i said if it wasn't him i don't know if i don't know if it would have helped mm. he knew exactly and it just it connected right yeah to your point yeah and also it's important that they have a sense of well that they're empathetic not not every counselor or therapist is empathetic i've met some who it quite clearly are just in it for the money yeah uh, yeah yeah how does that make you feel i will write in my notebook and make it look like i am trying to help you yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. sorry it's kind it's of like everyone in the field there are obviously there's apples in the bunch right there's yeah apples in the bunch so if you do get to a point where, where you are you know, seeking that kind of professional help and you feel that you're being served by a textbook, it's probably a good idea to, to find someone else. Yeah. And to your point, like if you don't feel a little trust right off the, like there's that just initial connection. Yeah. And I got lucky. I found it with the, the person on my first shot, but wow. if that wasn't right, I still would have looked, but not everybody affords themselves a second chance either. Right. Like mm. I tried. I, you know, you're already desperate, right? I tried, I, you know, keep trying, yeah. find your person. Yeah. Yeah. Find your That's person. Good. That's good. And uh, so my last story actually was quite recent. So it was in March of, uh, of last year. Um, I, uh, my 20 year relationship had ended, uh, resulting in me losing my uh, two dogs because I then had to work three jobs to keep a roof over my head. Uh, I was really stressed, uh, overworked. I was depressed. I was chucking myself into rebound relationships and uh, just my whole lifestyle really was pretty, pretty unhealthy. I was drinking a lot in the evening. Um, and the thing with self-medication, it, you know, in whatever form it is, it, it, it does provide a temporary relief, but in the long term, it completely fucks you up. Um, and it definitely exas exasperates the, uh, depression. Um, so I was at one of my jobs and I just had a breakdown at the desk and I just felt that I couldn't function. I, the phone was ringing. I literally couldn't pick it up and, uh, and, and do my job. So my manager took me to one side. Um, I told her a little of, of what was going on. She listened. She didn't judge me. Uh, she's actually, her name's Penny. She's uh, a really good friend uh, now. I'm no longer with that company. But she asked me to take some time off and go and speak to my mum. Now, I did go straight from from work to uh, to my mum's. Um, I absolutely love my mum. We had a really emotional chat. We don't often have those kinds of emotional chats, but there was a lot that I was uh, still keep keeping from her. Um, and there was a lot that I didn't tell my manager either, but just chatting, just having those initial chats really helped. Um, How but, did your friend recognize it or were you giving clear signals outside of the work or? Um, I wasn't aware that I was giving, I was, Penny wasn't a friend at the time. She was, she was my manager, or, or, although okay. we were friendly, yeah, she was my manager, but um, it was very clear that, that there was something not quite right. Uh, so, but what I didn't tell them was at, at that point, I actually had, had reached uh, the severe uh, level on that, on that scale that we spoke about last time. So I had a suicide plan. I had a method. Um, I had the means on how to do it. I'd written my suicide note and uh, every day I knew that that evening was going to be the evening when I would do it. And this went on for about a week. Um, I'd wake up in the morning. I'd be absolutely convinced that this would be the the, the day that I would do it. Uh, I can remember that at one of my other jobs, I 
I wouldn't say I became the life and soul, but I was definitely putting on a, a mask of, of happiness. And, uh, you know, we talk about helping, we, we spoke about helping other people a little bit more. There was a lot of that going on uh, during that week. Uh, so well, in addition to that, you had a plan, you already, you already resolved this. So the burden probably felt lifted slightly. Yeah, also. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There was a definite, a definite sense of uh, relief. Uh, so typically my days would, uh, I'd be at work until, uh, say nine 30 in the evening and I'd go home, I'd drink a lot, but then I would find myself on the phone to the Samaritans. I spoke about the Samaritans last time. And the reason why I think that I was reaching out, uh, for that added support was that there was this inner conflict going on. So I knew that I had this real strong desire to die, but there was a stronger desire for self-preservation. So that's why I knew that I had to speak to someone, because if I didn't speak to someone, there was no way that I could, I would die, basically. Because uh, you wouldn't, the self-preservation piece would be would not be supported missing. then. Yeah, it would point. be missing. Yeah, be missing. Yeah. So basically you wouldn't have that counter weight. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about emotional reality. So I got to that point because my emotional, my emotional reality was completely fucked up. It was absolutely, I was absolutely convinced that if I died, I would be releasing everyone from the burden of me that that my death somehow would open up my friends and family to more love and compassion. Um, and just like thinking about that now, I can't quite grasp what that meaning was at the time. But it was almost like I knew I had to die, but I also knew that I had to convince myself why I had to die. And for me dying, it was more about, yes, it was, it was about helping me with my own internal pain, but it was also about helping other people. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. It's, it's kind of parallels, you know, so many ways. Yeah, but it also gives weight to the fact that we do uh, everything is skewered. When, when you're in that, when you're in that zone, things don't make sense. They they seem to make sense at the time, but then when you come out of it, and you're so thankful that you've come out of it, you realise actually, what the f what what the fuck was going on there? Yeah, every once in a while, one plus one does feel like three. Yeah, but it's it it's really not ever three. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, but broken brain equals broken choice. I mean. We talk about even, you know, with, with substance abuse, right? Some Many times the substance abuse is more the masking of the whatever that underlying pain or trauma is. Mm. But then that creates worse decision making. So then that's what exacerbates it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you make and, a de you're making a decision not from your, your sane mind, I guess. And, and I can imagine, I mean, I felt it as well is like when the, when the, not the walls are closing in, but say that you get that singular focus and the, your periphery goes away. Hmm. All you see is that tunnel. You do not see any answer outside of that. No. And that's, I don't, it's either how the brain works or what, however we process as humans, but that's a real thing, but that doesn't mean it's reality. It's just how it feels at the time. Yeah. And like you said before, emotion aren't necessarily, emotions aren't necessarily reality. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so, so just to just to end that, uh, it, it got to yeah. the point where uh, I I knew that this certain uh, evening would be the evening. I uh, so I laid everything all out. I um, weirdly I had a bath because I wanted my body to be clean when it was found. Uh, but then just before I was going to to do it, I was looking at my mobile phone and I was kind of like watching the the clock tick by uh, for the time. But I was also, I kind of realized now that my mobile phone was a bit of a lifeline. I was hoping that I'd get a sign uh, that something would flash up on my phone to tell me not to do it. Again, it's that kind of self-preservation, that hope uh, yes. that was that was overriding that um, that feeling of wanting to die. And I actually got, a, um, I got two alerts. So I got an alert from Sky News. <laughs> Uh, it was a breaking news story about suicide, but but in my way of thinking, that was a sign. Get that, the fuck yeah. out! <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> really. Yeah, but that for oh me at gosh. that at that moment in time, that was a sign that I had to do it. You know, it was to a very, do it right. Yeah, it was a very right. clear sign. Uh, but then I received uh, a message from someone on Facebook that I'd never really spoken to. It was like one of these random Facebook friends that maybe pop up in your suggested and. Uh, 
I can't remember when I befriended them. It was probably quite a, quite a while before that. And they just sent a message saying, how you doing? <laughs> and that just clicked me out of it. It's all it needed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just going back to that. It's those small, it's those small things, you know, that, that was yeah. the sign that I needed, needed. There was someone there. Yeah. My, my sign was literally you're different. Yeah. <laughs> just the acknowledgement <laughs> yeah. that once again, am I, I don't really fucking know. Do I feel it? Yeah. I feel it to mm-hmm. your point. What I feel, you know, perception becomes reality, right? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've, I felt different. So how are you different? Well, with this other stuff that came in. So, I mean, do you really want to know my labels right now? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, How about a, I'm a star seed from Sirius with empath, precognitive uh, empathic abilities. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know what the fuck that means anymore, but, (laughs) but that's, you know, like I said, that really opened up things for me with meeting this one person at Mm. the right time. Yeah. And that's just about someone taking that time, isn't it? And, you know, and that's that and that's what we've been talking about, taking time, just talking to someone and and being real with them, being being genuine with them as well. Tony, I don't know you that well, but we have become fast friends. If you feel anything, you know what you feel. Reach out, man. I'm here. Mm-hmm. I don't always know, but if I, if I, if I feel you in my senses, I'll shoot something to you. All right. Cheers. Thanks, Mark. I don't, uh, and just to kind of counter, uh, to counter that, that was last year. My life has, has made a dramatic change through a lot of hard work that, that I've put in. I'm at a much better place. I feel that there's a lot of emotional distance from, from what happened there. Yes. I do know that I have that capacity and that at some point in the future, it could rear its head again. But I also know that I've got the tools to uh, to make sure it doesn't get to that point. So from, yes. from where I am, I, I consider that to be the lowest point, and I'm just not going to get to that point again. Absolutely. And not, I, I, none of your loved ones would want you to be at that point ever again. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you, you would be greatly missed. I can't, I can't even imagine how many people... Uh, how many people's lives you touch with the work that you do so and also i would miss out on life you know and i think yeah when, when you've your gone own through, life damn it well yeah but when you've gone through something like that uh, i don't know about you right. but i i i have much more of an appreciation for life now um it, you know even just the simple things like hearing birds in the in the trees if i'm walking to work um yeah there's just a, a, a yeah there's like a heightened sense of the of the environment or just the, the world right yeah everything's a little sharper like you you hear you hear and smell the smell of that rose or you know the rustling of a of leaves on a tree or something yeah it's interesting well thank you for sharing your stories i'm you you've obviously been and been through a lot um, uh, yeah i you know <sighs> but but then but then haven't we all you know we've, yes, we've, no, we've all got still, our, we've all got yeah. our stories haven't we and, and that's the thing you know it's funny how relative that is as well right i mean the struggle of whether harry is going to go to his grandfather's funeral with megan or without oh she's not coming okay well but you understand like the stress yeah. of that thought is myriad different from a child who's duct taped in a closet because yeah. it won't stop crying yeah you know what I mean? Like these are relative traumatic events yeah. to their, to their respective people. Right. So like sometimes what would seem very minuscule to one might be a large event to someone else. Yeah. So it is, there is some compassion there uh, when you say no judging, right? You, I think no judgment is kind of one of your themes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and thank you for sharing that because that that's big is, uh, wait, if I share this, are you going to make fun? Am I going to be made fun of, ridiculed? Uh, why would I share this with you? Yeah. And sometimes you might consider your own issues or your own problems to be insignificant. Well, you know, like you've just said, they're not insignificant to you. Uh, so it's important that if you, if you are speaking to someone, you know, if, you're, if you are helping someone through to not minimize, you know, their problems or what they're going through. Yeah. On that note, sir, I think... Uh, 
I think we've had enough tears for today. <laughs> but in a, but I think we've had some great progress as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been a really good chat. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much. And and thank you for sharing. And, you know, apologies in general for what you went through. Obviously, I know personally I couldn't do anything, but I'm just sorry for the situations that you were put in. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Um, to that point, anyone listening to this, I, I'm not a professional, but if you need an ear, I've got two of them. If you need a shoulder, I got two. So... My Twitter is at KnockedCon, K-N-O-C-K-E-D-C-O-N. Feel free to DM me or send me, you know, send me a message at, at KnockedCon me. Um, I, I, you know, I'll listen. I'll give time that I have when I have it. So, and know that you will, someone will miss you. What's that? Anything else? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of a loss there. No, I think, I mean, you could, you, you, you can't say enough really, Mark. I mean, the fact that you want to listen and the fact that, you know, people are going to be missed, they're really important messages to get out there. And uh, just on the same kind of theme, although my uh, Twitter handle is Michael Jackson related, you don't just have to get in contact with me regarding uh, the King of Pop. Uh, so if you want to reach out, it's mjnewsdigest at twitter.com. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, feel free. And Tony, I, if someone does come to me, I hope that uh, I might be able to bounce some ideas off of you as well. Cause yeah, you, cool. you've, thank you for bringing this to, or just for us to talk about. It's one of, I mean, it's, this is one of the f- main reasons I wanted to start the podcast in the first place. Uh, I think on my first episode, it's about the connection, right? Mm. There are 7.7 billion people out there. And some people feel like they're only 1% of that, right? Yeah. But even if you're 1% of 1%, that's still like 770,000 people. Mm. Gotcha. There's, there's somebody out there. There's yeah. somebody with whom you can connect. Yeah. Um, just know that, uh, feel that. And I think if you, if you just have that kind of comfort understanding that there is, that you will align yourself to find that person. Or the energy, you know what I mean? That you might find that person through that thought process. Yeah, it's about putting that thought out there, isn't it? It and, really is. I mean, and, there is some manifestation involved here. Yeah, the thought transfers to energy. Thought is an energy. Amen. And that energy will come back. Yeah. Um, any closing thoughts about Alex or Mark or, gosh darn, it's Chris, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't have any any closing thoughts about them, but I, I'm sure I'll be thinking about them quite a bit this evening. Yeah, I'll be thinking about them a lot, and I'll be thinking about Jay. Yeah. Um, you're missed, my friend. Tony, I love you, man. I love you too, Mark, and thanks so Thank much you. for this opportunity and also for sharing your stories. Thank you. Um, if there if there's anything you know, if you if you ever want to reach out, you have my information, my friend. Okay, and vice versa. All right. This has been another episode of Not Conscious, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Tony, closing words, my friend. You always have something inspirational to say. (laughs) Just to repeat from last time, be kind to yourself. Be kind to other people. Uh, Make time for other people. But also make make time for yourself as well. We're all so busy these days, but it's really important just to have some me time every now and again. And check in with yourself. Do a bit of self-inventory. And... um, yeah, gain a little bit more insight into yourself and other people. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you again, sir. Everyone, have yourself a blessed day. Take care. <laughs>